give a briefing on the concept of fostering and what is needed in fostering. I'll speak for a few minutes in general terms about it, and then Yavid and Yosef will talk about uh, the more detailed aspect that relates to CSTDA. I Yes, yeah. I think we've gone out of it. That's me, I'm a veterinary surgeon of 40 years of experience. I'm uh, heavily involved with animal welfare throughout Australia. Victoria and Australia, I've been involved with RSPCA for more years than I can just about remember. And, uh, and I'm still involved with them. This week, next week, I'll be spending three days in Queensland looking at animal welfare in Australia altogether. And so, this is my credential of coming to be involved with this project, I would imagine. Whenever I talk about uh, whenever I talk about animal dogs, cats, horses, whatever, animals uh, use, I like to always just make sure that we understand the benefit, that we see the benefit of animals, use of animal, enjoyment of animals. So on the screen in front of you is some uh, scientifically proven facts about the benefit of owning a pet. What you can highlight the word pet. So in a minute we will be talking about service dogs rather than pets. Okay. The pets yeah. with a fair amount of scientifically proven evidence how valuable it is for us as human beings, as people, children, families. And I think you can see up there it reduces it number of times that we go to see a doctor, it improves our level of cholesterol and blood pressure, it uh, helps us deal with stress in a much better way than people who do not have animals. It helps us recover from illnesses and surgery, and uh, obviously get us to feel less lonely than what we might be feeling without animals. And animals help us live a much longer life, a healthier life, a happier and more active life. This is all with regard to pets, as I mentioned. It offers us companionship, affection, and a reason to keep alive, active in the life, so to speak. And I won't go any further, I mean, we can go talk about the benefit of animals and human animal bond for many, many, many hours. But I think just to try and make sure that there is great value of owning a pet and having an association with a pet. But service dog is even more important. Because service dogs not, not, not just serve us as pets, they serve us in helping us overcome whatever disabilities or whatever issues of health issues that we may have. And I think that makes them that much more valued in our relationship. The use of animals as a, as a form of treatment becoming more widely recognized and accepted around the world. The ultimate aim of use of service dog in a various situation, whether it be the blind, whether it be with autism, whether it be with Alzheimer, whether it be with epilepsy, whether it be with the hearing impaired, and a whole range of other, other disabilities. The aim of, of the whole program is to uh, improve the emotional, social, cognitive, and functional well-being of the person involved. Or if we are using it in, in a group session situation, well, that's looking at a group rather than an individual. It uh, improves the quality of life, and the main thing is to enhancing and maintaining independence and social inclusion. These are the really main issues with a lot of the disabilities, trying to get overcome the issues. So that is sort of a bit of the benefit from, from the service dog point of view. But today's discussion is really about fostering. So we take a service dog, we need to have this service dog selected, bred, born as a puppy. We then need to do things to that service dog from a puppyhood till maybe the nine, ten months of age, a year old, when we then attach give that dog to the family that will actually, or the client, that will leave this dog for the rest of the life and assist that family. Fostering come in the middle now because we have the puppy who was born and was at the breeder's farm. 
till later on, eight weeks of age. And now we have from eight weeks to ten months or a year, we'll call it, the period where we need to do things. And that the period that we refer to as fostering. It's given to a family, given, taken, accepted, I mean, the terms are seen a little bit loose at the moment, that the family will do things with a dog, yeah. with a pup, that required not just for themselves as a pet, but more importantly, for the organization that does it, to foster and to train. There is foster arrangement with RSPCA about puppies. There is foster arrangement with RSPCA about all dogs that are given to RSPCA and there are people who look after them. There is foster arrangement with a whole range of other situations. Blind dog, the old Victorian Blind Dog Association have a major fostering arrangement. They call it puppy walkers, but it's the same concept. So fostering is not just to give a home for a dog, there's a fair amount of commitment to look after the dog and do what's necessary to make that service dog as useful and as valuable as it is with a person that's actually going to be benefiting from him. But obviously people who, who, uh, who have uh, agreed to foster dogs obviously have their aspect, their take. They learn a lot of things. They get an, uh, an involvement. They help an organization, help disabled people to eventually get a dog and, and be healthy. So, I mean, there really is a fair amount of good feeling of doing the right thing uh, as well as enjoyment of having a dog, admittedly, only maybe for eight, nine, ten months or a year before giving it away. Some people are actually doing continuing to take another foster dog and then raise that one. So, there is a benefit in that sort of a concept. The needs of the family. The needs of the organization, in this case here is CSTDA, but the RSPCA or the other organization I mentioned, and the needs of the puppies are crucial in those relationships. We are not going to talk answers, we are not going to throw into the full discussion about this, but just to recognize that we have those three needs that need to be met in that relationship. And there are a whole range of requirements depending on what the dog is going to do later on in life. If you're going to be a seeing eye dog, you might need certain training. If you're going to be helping an autistic person, you might need a different training. And all those, many of those services will be delivered during the time that the dog is, or certainly initiated during the time that the dog is in foster. And last but not least in all this issue is that the issue of who is responsible for what. Which I think is important from a foster family point of view for you to think about that and be a cognitive of, of that uh, aspect. I think I'll probably uh, just elaborate a little bit more about the aspect of fostering. We need to think of facilities. We need to think of conditions, training, time. You need to think, do you have the facilities, the time, the, the capacity to commit for that? There are always some legal issues. Who owns the dog? Where is the dog registered? Microchip? Issue of going with the dog in the street, walking the dog, what to be on the lead, and the whole range of legal issues that, of owning a dog, which uh, I think it's not that uh, difficult. And I'm not trying to, in any stage try and make it difficult for you. I'm just trying to make sure that you are cognizant of that, of those sort of issues. I. Come in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm absolutely. Uh, um, I'm absolutely in favour of the whole concept, so I just think it's important to understand it. Upkeep costs of the dog, the, the whole range of costs, the vaccination, of food, of worming, of fleet, of, of call-out, of leads, of, you know, the whole range of issues. Those issues need to be clear in the relationship uh, of that situation. Uh, I think, ultimately, fostering, in a way, you can argue that it is all care, shared responsibility. And I think it's something that we need to be cognizant of. When you have a puppy body, but well, there are a whole lot of issues that relate to puppy care. And again, I will not be going and starting to let them talk for hours on every one of those issues individually. But there is a housing, there is a nutritional care, there is a health and well-being aspects, there is a grooming, coat care, some of it 
may need to be done by you, some of it may need to be done professionally as well. There's exercise and socialization. There's definitely exercise and socialization that you have to do as a, as a fosterer. And the aspect of this, and particularly as we move to the last line on that slide, the training that's going to be done through CSTDA because they're the one who prepared this dog to the group. That the purpose that it, is, uh, it is intended to. Environmental stimulation and enrichment is a very important thing in, in our dogs. The smaller the areas we live in, the more secluded the way we live, rather than on a big farm, the more important it is. The more we go to work and leave the dog all day long at home, come back in the evening, the more it's important for us to provide enrichment and environmental stimulation to prevent stereotypic yes, problem. And as a veterinary surgeon, I see plenty of those uh, anxiety syndrome in dogs across my consulting room table down there. Uh, but it's really the environment and the way we live that bring some of those issues. Uh, just to highlight, just you know, I think it's, fostering is great. I think it's, it's, I, I commend you. If, if you know to go to to go in and, and do those sort of things, I uh, really think it's a tremendous benefit for you and for the dog and the organization. But just to highlight some few issues that sometimes arise, that I think just to be cognizant again that we need to make sure that things don't get out of the city, out of way. Overfeeding and other exercising dogs is a common problem with fostering. It's a big tip. And uh, failure to provide for the behavioral needs that I've just identified before, anxiety and things like this develop. Use of inappropriate, inhumane sometimes training methods, people using the wrong things, using inappropriate equipment, some of the colors, electronic colors, some, there's some okay. element of that shouldn't be done, okay. and people need to be aware of it. Ensuring okay. effective rest for the pup, sometimes you get a foster pup being actually <coughs> overdriven by the rest of the family. There's three or four children and everyone wants to do everything and so the dogs just become overworked. This is, by the way, issue that sometimes happens uh, yeah. with the dog at the client place. Uh, you know, the, the dog just doesn't get enough time to rest and stay away from excessive activity. Probably one of the most, uh, one of the most important things that, uh, that I think it needs to be remembered is falling in love with that dog. Sometimes it's a, it's a really hard thing because you fall in love with a pup and you want the pup to stay with you, but really you're fostered the pup. So it's a pup that aims to go somewhere else. So yes, we need to fall in love because we need to look after the puppy in a most loving care, care, but we just need to know not to go overboard with the love so we can say goodbye at some stage and enjoy the benefit of I've helped this dog to be what he is to help someone else to do those benefits. So I think but this is a very common problem for the world. Foster care, delivery, I think we need to be cognizant and remember that we need to follow effective protocol. There ought to be a program, which you read, we'll talk in a minute. They then need to remember the local laws and the state laws about prevention of cruelty to animals, about domestic animal act, which we have to be done managed under this sort of a situation in, 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 you know, certainly in Victoria, but in Australia. We need to remember that the dog need to be individualized. So we might have four or five dogs, a different breed, a different size, a different uh, use, a need. And so it's an individual problem. And yes, we need to share that responsibility and accountability. So I think it needs to be uh, sorted out. I think from my point of view, as an advocate of the of the dog in the, uh, in, uh, in the scenario, that last line is absolutely paramount. Whatever we do, we need to remember that the welfare of that dog should never be compromised. And I don't think we can, not, not even to help someone else. So I don't think we can sacrifice a dog to help a person. I think morally and ethically it's not right in my doggy eyes. I don't think I want to talk no. about any of those things because I think this is just not relevant for this moment of time, but relevant in other discussions. But really, in conclusion, I think fostering can be a very rewarding and enjoyable for the foster family. It is definitely a most valuable developmental stage for the fostered puppy. 
It is important to ensure that you know what you want from the program and the relationship with the organization for whom you will be fostering a part. I believe that written agreement should be underpinning the fostering arrangement and the relationship between the fostering family and the organization that own the dog. Uh, do, uh, and, um, oh, well, then, yeah, that you know. I don't want to go on the water, I guess, but two lines on that list. And I think uh, with that, I really wanted to leave this overall situation for you to think about, focus on, and I'll ask Yariv to uh, go on and talk.